Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Good evening. I am Tammy Boyd, Chief Policy Officer and Counsel for the Black Women's Health Imperative. On behalf of BWHI and our President and CEO, Linda Goler Blount, I'd like to welcome you to BWHI's Anniversary Week and our Healthy Dose Conversations. BWHI has been on the front lines to address and find solutions for the most pressing health issues affecting Black women and girls. Today, we continue this legacy by addressing the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on Black women and other people of color. Through our partnerships, we are excited to announce an initiative with the National Council of Negro Women and the Women's National Basketball Players Association. This initiative will help inform strategies across the country to increase access to COVID-19 vaccinations in communities of color. So as we get underway, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Angela Rye. Angela is an award-winning host, social justice advocate, and lawyer. Her thoughtful yet incisive commentary and real talk about social justice, politics, culture, and history sparks much needed conversation about the state of America. She's also been seen on several programs and outlets from The Breakfast Club to The Daily Show, BET, where she has been nominated for multiple NAACP Image Awards. She has also been featured in publications including the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Essence, Washington Post, Glamour, Ebony, and The Undefeated. Angela is the principal and CEO of Impact Strategies, a political advocacy, social impact, and racial equity firm based in Washington, D.C where she creates strategic partnerships and coalitions with Capitol Hill, third party organizations and influencers to ensure societal change. She's had a successful career on Capitol Hill where I first got to know Angela Rye, where she served as the executive director and general counsel to the Congressional Black Caucus. She also served as senior policy advisor and counsel for the House Committee on Homeland Security. With more than 15 years of political strategy, and social responsibility experience. Without further ado, my friend and the bringer of truth, Angela Rye. Um, you all do not know this, but Tammy is my Benny Gordon Thompson family, um, both having worked for Congressman Thompson on Capitol Hill, and she has truly been a sister every time I see Tammy. She is smiling and she's always, always working to uplift black women. So thank you, Tammy, for sharing this space with me today. Um, at this time, we have some additional welcome remarks. Um, and of course, I wanna just take a moment um, to thank all of the partners of BWHI to, who put this on. Um, and so at this time, we're gonna have um, Terry Carmichael Jackson, who's the executive director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association to bring brief remarks. Terry. It is commonly known in black and brown communities that women play the role of chief health officers for their families. We play a big role in the health decisions for our children, our elder parents, our partners, ourselves. As we have seen in the socio-political space, the women of the W have pretty powerful voices and they can help mobilize communities. It made sense then to prioritize a public health initiative such as COVID-19 vaccine education to promote awareness and access to enable our folks to make empowered decisions. As they've always done, the players sought first to get informed with educational Zooms led by health professionals from all across the country, those who understood COVID and the vaccines better than most. Armed with information, our next step was to seek out strategic partnerships with 
the Black Women's Health Imperative, Happy 20th Anniversary, BWHI, and NCNW, National Council of Negro Women. Let's be clear, these are the folks who are doing the work. So when the Black Women's Health Imperative announced a COVID-19 vaccine initiative specifically aimed at reaching Black women and communities of color, we were right there with them. The campaign, by the way, was made possible through the philanthropy of the Rockefeller Foundation. And breaking news, the WNBPA and BWHI and NCNW have formed a mighty trifecta and will launch a Take the Shot for the Win campaign featuring WNBA players. As executive director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association, the union that represents WNBA players, I report to them. I execute their vision. It is my privilege to be here today with Elizabeth Williams, a member of our player leadership, basketball legend Lisa Leslie, the esteemed health professionals to include our newest super fan, Dr. Contessa. And it is my pleasure to wear this t-shirt because we may very well be the only fully vaxxed players association, fully vaxxed league in all of professional sports at a rate of 99%. And with that, I'll leave it right there and turn it back over to you, Angela. Thank you so much, Terry. What an exciting announcement. We know that our communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And so to see your leadership and to be following the leadership of your players is very, very special to all of us. And it means that we'll all be that much safer. At this time, I want to turn it over to Dr. Janetta Veshko. Um, many of you all know her from being a superstar president at Spelman College. Um, and of course, so many others, Bennett College, and now she is the president at the National Council of Negro Women. And it is always an honor to share space with this superstar, Dr. Cole. If someone asked me to list the situations I'd like to be in, because they will bring me joy. I would include tonight. It really doesn't get any better than this. My young Shiro, Angela Rye, convening us. And then when I look in this direction, who do I see but Sister Leader Terry? Terry, you just don't stop making the points. And no, I'm not talking about what's up on that board. I'm talking about the points that are central to the lives, to the well being of Black women. So tonight, you talk about something special. Listen to this. The National Council of Negro Women is going into a partnership with Black Women's Health Imperative and the WNBPA. We love partnerships. You know, if you want to put your mind around what a partnership is, listen to African Proverbs. One that says, when spider webs unite, they can even tie up a lion. And so if we've got this thing, this wretched thing that is affecting our health, watch black women unite to tie it up. And then, of course, there's that wonderful proverb that lots of us are using. It says, if you want to go fast, go ahead, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So for all of the Black women, our members counting over 2 million, know that this partnership is real for us and that we will be a good partner. The work of NCNW is quite simply to advocate for, 
to advance the well-being of black women, our families, and our communities. And if healthy dose isn't about that, I don't know what it is about. So thank you, sisters all. If there just happened to be a one or two or three righteous brothers sneaking in to check us out, I greet you as well. We will be a good partner. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole, and thank you, Terry. We so appreciate your opening remarks, this partnership, and of course, sisterhood and unity. We always need that, and we know that Black women are going to make this happen. We've conquered many things in this life. COVID-19 will be one of them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. At this time, everyone, I have the great privilege and honor of serving as your moderator for tonight's panel discussion. I want you all to know that the panel will be taking your questions, so please be sure to place them in the comments. You can also continue to send all the love from where you all are hailing from geographically. A lot of love for Dr. Cole in the, in the uh, comments as well. Whatever you want to share, feel free to put it in the comments. And again, your questions will also be answered, but we'll take the love. A little love doesn't hurt. Tonight's panelists are Lisa Leslie, a former player in the WNBA, a three-time MVP, a four-time Olympic gold medalist, and a, a superstar and hero of mine. I would never got quite tall enough and wasn't good enough in basketball. So Lisa, I'll just live vicariously through you. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an honor to speak with you and to listen to, gosh, Dr. Cole, who we know we could listen to all day, and Terry Jackson, just uh, amazing her leadership, and just so happy to be here. And um, I, I love just being surrounded and listening to all of these positive uh, affirmations and quotes. And so uh, just really excited to add my little two cents and hopefully we can help out someone else out there who's listening as well. So thanks for having me. Lisa. Absolutely. And I say, we next have uh, Dr. Contessa Metcalf, who many of you all may have seen on Married to Medicine. Tonight, it is not a reality show. We're keeping it all real life. <laughs> and she's here to um, help us break down the facts about um, COVID-19 and how we can overcome that. Uh, welcome, Dr. Contessa Metcalf. Thank you so much for having me. And I do feel like I am surrounded by all my personal heroes. <laughs> you, Angela Rye, Lisa Leslie. I literally, growing up, had Dr. Cole's picture on my wall as a woman to aspire to, to emulate. So, and Terry Jackson, I mean, everybody, everyone was here. So, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And now we have. Elizabeth Williams, who is a current WNBA player for the Atlanta Dream and the WNBPA secretary. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Angela. And just like everyone said, it's an honor to be on this panel and just share the space with you and, and have a really important conversation that needs to be had in this community. So I'm just excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much. And for those of y'all that were offering up all of your geographical shout outs, Elizabeth has you um, recognized behind her on the wall. She's got the full <laughs> United States behind her. So she's got y'all, okay? Y'all can keep shouting them out, but just so you know, we see you, literally. <laughs> um, next we have Dr. Jess Clemens, um, a board certified psychiatrist joining us um, and here to help us break it down. Even what's happening mentally with us, right? We got some People who are clearly having some um, challenges, some legitimate, we do not want to at all um, undermine what people are experiencing as they consider the vaccine, the fallout from the vaccine, whether or not they should get it. So hopefully you can help us work through some of that and whatever trauma we're carrying that would prevent us from getting vaxxed up. We want to get through that. Welcome, Dr. Jess. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm also thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, ladies, well, let's jump right in. Um, I know you were warned that I might not ask the questions that were prepared. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> this is what happens. I'm going to just deal with what's present for me. And like I said, for those of you who have questions, please make sure you submit them in the comments. But let's get to this. So one of the things that recently came up for me, I was talking to one of my best friends who's in administration at Cedar sinai 
And she was saying that, you know, I was like, what's the deal with, you know, we're vaccinated. People are still getting sick. I know they said it's not as bad, but what are you seeing in the numbers at the hospital? So she said to me, what's interesting is people who are saying they're vaccinated only got one dose. So the people who have been hospitalized received the first dose, but didn't necessarily get the second dose. She did have someone um, who uh, was an elder, right, in, in their um, late 80s, who was in the hospital and um, and not vaccine. I mean, sorry, and had both vaccines, um, both both parts of the vaccine. But for the most part, people had not received both doses. So I first want to talk to the folks at home and maybe the sisters that are sharing space with us tonight. Um, if you only got one dose, Dr. Contessa, I'm going to start with you. Why should they go back and get the second dose? And if you only got one dose, don't be shamed. Put it in there. Let's talk to you directly. Well, what's interesting is that people sometimes think symptoms means like, oh, I had a side effect to the vaccine. Well, what actually happens is when you get vaccinated, you're actually getting a little, you're getting the information, right? And so your body is taught to fight this as a foreign invader. And so a normal response is that you do have some kind of response. For instance, when kids get vaccinated, a lot of times, you know, they get a fever afterwards. And that just means that it's activating your immune system. So for some people, they thought, oh, something's wrong. Something happened. I'm not going to get the second vaccine. Mm -hmm. However, the problem is that that first vaccine does kind of give you a little bit of the information, but that second vaccine, it's almost like going to practice and then going through a scrimmage and then playing the game, right? The idea is to get you ready for the game. So going to practice one time doesn't necessarily give you all the information that you necessarily need and it doesn't boost your immunity enough. We want you to get to that 95%. 50% is good, but the issue is we wanna give you the best possible information and the best chance of fighting the infection fully. Thank you. So since we're using all these um, basketball analogies and talking oh, about scrimmages and getting ready for the game, let's talk about the brothers. So apparently um, more women are getting vaccinated than the men. Um, Lisa, if you were talking to, talking to one of your brother friends, what would you tell them about why it's important to get vaccinated? And if you want me to role play, I can tell you some of the nonsense <laughs> that I've been hearing, but I'm sure we've all heard it. So. <laughs> Lisa, what do you say to the resistant brother friend of yours who does not want to get vaccinated? You know what? Without putting these men on blast, because, you know, I'm the coach <laughs> in the big three and quite a few of these black men do not have the vaccine shot, not even the first shot. So here, let me just give you my real story. The vaccine, when it first came out, obviously we were dealing with social injustice. We were dealing with a lack of trust with our government and all of our redlining and all the issues that we've already, we as black people are going through with our government. To then have a vaccine rolled out that was like, oh, but this is good for you, really put a lot of black people and brown people on defense because we're like, we already don't trust you. You've already set up this system for us not to have trust. How do you then expect for us to trust you, right? This is where I think our people are coming from. And in some ways we look at it and we divide it in an educational standpoint, like, oh, some people are more educated than not. But you can see why we have reason collectively not to trust the government, right? So what happened to me personally, I got an opportunity to get the vaccine early, like March, early March. And I got my first shot, set it up. And I'm like, girl, can you get my husband in? Like, I'm trying to hook it up, like get my mom in. Let me drive her over. And my husband cancels his appointment, right? He like, babe, I got one more day of work and then I'll go do it. Goes to work, comes home and his coworker calls, my husband's a pilot. So his co-captain, my husband's the captain. So the co-pilot calls, got COVID. Now he has to go get tested. He has COVID. Great. I got my shot. He gets COVID and is in quarantine in our house. First, the first 10 days. And let me just be honest with y'all. This is the first time I'm seeing COVID. You hear about it, but then when you see it, COVID is no joke. Let me just tell you, my husband has no underlying illnesses. He doesn't smoke. We have probably four drinks a year. Like we are 
pretty clean in every aspect, healthy, go to the gym. My husband almost died. So for me to see that and have to really nurse him back to life and take him to the hospital, and then he got COVID-induced pneumonia, then he got a blood clot in his lungs. Like we went through every phase. So because I saw it with my own eyes and saw my husband go from 255 pounds down to 230 on a, you know, wet, I already know what COVID looks like. And so by me knowing that, I got my second shot, of course, um, and recommended it to everybody. And I felt like it was a testimony for us to see it because I was on the other side before, just kind of like, oh, no, you know, we just been through a lot. You know, we've been out here in these streets like we've been doing so much fighting for our lives as black people. And then to have this vaccine come, it was tough. But I will tell you, you know, hand to God, everybody who is eligible to get it should get it because yes, you can get COVID, but the likelihood of you not dying and not being able to breathe statistically, I don't know how I was able not to get it because I served my husband and I was like sliding the food under the door kind of stuff. And it to a point where he couldn't make it to the door anymore. And then I had to go in, you know? So for me, I went through an experience that was life changing. And I try to share this story, although it's very personal, to help our people to understand that when you see it and it affects your loved one, you will understand the importance of getting that vaccine. So I know you didn't ask me all that, but I just had to share because I think it's so important. And by me seeing it and living it, and my husband is still having some, you know, residual um, pain if you will, from what happened in March, that is so real. And I just recommend it for everybody. And all those men, I tell them this story and they're like, dang, at least for real, for real. Like you need to go get your shots, seriously. Wow, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing <laughs> that and for being so vulnerable. Um, that is hard, it's hard to hear. And I know there are many amongst us who you know, didn't have the success story, right? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that came to mind is my friend, Sunny Hostin, um, who some of you all know from The View, lost not one of her in-laws, but both of her in-laws to COVID. Both of them are medical doctors, right? Um, right before the holidays. So it, I mean, it is, it knows, it, it, it takes no prisoners. It knows no geographic bounds, knows no economic bounds. Like it is a killer and it's not even a silent killer, right? Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Jess, I wanna come to you because Lisa brought up a really um, profound point, one that we wrestle with at kitchen tables long before COVID. Um, we often hear people talk about, you know, the distrust of the medical profession um, because of the many experiences that Lisa alluded to. You know, black folks have never been safe um, mm -hmm. necessarily in, in healthcare systems. And I want you to just um, give space or help us to hold space for the people who are dealing with very real anxiety, right, around a medical system that has traditionally and disproportionately not served Black people. What do we say to hold space for them, but also to remind them to get that shot? Right? <laughs> we can do both. We got to do both. We can. We can. I, you know, I definitely, while I have an opportunity here, want to just thank you, Lisa, for sharing that. I mean, I, I know people watching are, are moved, and my hope is that they will go get that vaccine. I mean, that's incredibly difficult what you've been going through as a family. To folks who are dealing with anxiety around getting the vaccine, you know, a lot of what I do in the, my practice when I'm caring for people is I, I try not to engage in this us versus them, right? It's not the anti-vaxxers versus the vaxxers. It, it's, it's really down to working with where we are. And a lot of times, Angela, what I do is I work with that ambivalence. It's that, it's that part of us that says, I know I need to do this, but there's still many layers to maybe what's keeping me going there. Fear is one, right? The historic uh, distrust that we have. We all talk about the Tuskegee experiment, but what, what does that really mean, right? That's embedded in, in us and that's embedded in the way that we think about healthcare. We're talking a lot now about like black maternal health and, and, the, and the outcomes that affect black women who are going in to just have a baby, which should be a very exciting part of our life. So it's very real. So what I try to do is meet people where they are all of us can do this at our kitchen table, right? Or over the Zoom meetings, if you're being really safe, which I'm hoping that you are. 
start by understanding where are people in their decision making, right? Are you afraid because you saw someone have an immune response to the COVID vaccine and you're afraid you're gonna get sick? Let's speak to that, right? Let's arm them with information, with education, but also understanding what's getting in the way. Is what's getting in the way, is it access to, to care? Are you having trouble just getting a ride to get to, you know, get vaccinated? If we're not having these questions answered, we're not really able to really support and address it. So I think the anxiety that people are experiencing right now is normal. We're in unprecedented times. There is a lot of uncertainty, but what we do know is certain is that the vaccine prevents significant illness, right? It prevents people from getting hospitalized and dying. And so as leaders of our family and community, it's important that we take all of those steps we need to, to not only protect ourselves, but our community and the people we love. Thank you so much, Dr. Jess. Elizabeth, I wanna to come to you because you all have quite the success story at the WNBA with so many players vaccinated. What was the path to getting everyone vaccinated um, and what would you encourage folks to do at home um, in terms of following you all's best practices to ensure that we all have that success story going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think Dr. Clemens said it best, arming ourselves with information. That was absolutely number one. We said, uh, you know, a lot of us had questions. I think a lot of times there's this misconception that people shouldn't be hesitant or people shouldn't have questions when in reality it shows that a lot of people care. Um, a lot of people want the proper information. And so for us, it was, okay, how do we make sure that we're, as a league of Black women in a pandemic that's disproportionately affecting Black people, how do we make sure we're armed with the proper information? And so we made sure that we sought out resources and um, were able to connect with public health experts, um, epidemiologists, um, OBGYNs, people who specifically work with women, um, and asking them questions about the vaccine. Um, and what it means to be vaccinated. And, and so I think the initial step of just players wanting to seek out information and being informed, that's what helped people become more confident in wanting to get vaccinated. And then seeing, um, you know, once more and more players started to get vaccinated and, and people felt more comfortable, that was how we continued to move in this direction of, you know, teams being fully vaccinated and, t and staffs being fully vaccinated. And now we're at the point where we have this 99% vaccination rate and we haven't had a positive COVID, te uh, COVID test since the season started. Um, and so I think it's just a testament to the women in this league and wanting to be informed and feel like we can go back to our communities and give them real information and be a testament of taking that information, making an informed decision and eventually you know, being safe for ourselves and our communities. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm curious, uh, Dr. Contessa, what can we do um, to help people understand that the side effects from the vaccine might be slightly less yeah. uh, long-term intrusive than the side effects from COVID? Sure. So when we talk about people with severe adverse effects, we're talking seven per one million. Mm -hmm. Seven per one million people have a severe reaction. And that's not uncommon, period, in vaccines. So that we're talking about this isn't a special thing that's happening only for COVID vaccine. It's literally happening for all vaccines. Um, so that's it's common for people to not have any adverse reactions. And you mounting an immune response is actually a great thing. Because another thing that we've also found is that some people, unfortunately, don't know that there's a system, an issue with their immune system. And so they may get vaccinated, but they don't mount an immune response. Like we actually find that with people with PPD, right? We sometimes will check, you know, we do like a PPD in, in healthcare. And so we find, right, after a certain period of time, some people just are non responders. And so it's not unusual for people, for a small percentage of people, not to actually mount an immune response. The second thing that we really have to remember is that we use the term SARS-CoV and COVID interchangeably. COVID is the disease. The infection, the virus itself, is in the environment, right? So you getting vaccinated does not mean that you don't live in the world and you can't contract the virus. Our fear, our issue is that you're going to get hospitalized, get really, really sick, and possibly die. That is what the vaccine does. It doesn't prevent you from 
being a human and living in the world and being exposed to something that is around, right? It's a respiratory virus. You can get it. However, you can also unfortunately get really, really sick. And I always kind of liken it to Russian roulette, right? So you don't know what's going to happen. And we don't know what's going to happen from person to person. One person may get it. All they lose is taste or smell. And they don't even realize that. So they just go into work, living in the world, and they're passing it around to everybody that they know. And some people that they don't. Some people get really, really sick, unfortunately, that, like Lisa Leslie's husband. But we don't know how to predict that. And the thing that has never changed is there is no treatment for COVID. That's the facts. So I, it, again, when people get frustrated and you know, and they get admitted to the hospital, they come into the ER and they're floridly sick. They're at the point where we call it where basically it's just running its course. They want us to do something. And that's what, when you're watching the news, when you're watching doctors, when you're watching the, um, the politicians, what you're missing is that frustration that what they're really trying to say with that frustration is we still don't have anything that we can provide to you at the point that you get sick. The only thing we can do is primary prevention, which is really try to make you not get sick at all. And that's what the, or if you do get sick, just maybe a little sick. And that's what the vaccine does. And so, um, Hopefully I answered your question, but that's really kind of the thing that I just really want to continue to highlight for people. Our hands is in medicine are tied. I know people think that we're gods or that we have some magical powers, but we don't. We only have the armamentarium of the medicine that we offer and the kind of you know intubation if you need some help breathing, but we don't have a cure for this terrible disease. And so we want to do our best to keep as many people healthy and strong as we possibly can. And the best thing to do is really not to get really sick. Yeah, that makes sense. Dr. Jess, I wanna to come to you again with a, a mental health question. And that is, I know there are a number of people who suffered um, you know, isolation greatly during um, the first quarantine. I'm hoping we don't end up in a second quarantine, but seeing as how these vaccines are set up and people not going, that might be where we find ourselves. But I really wanna focus in on the doctors like Dr. Contessa Metcalf and others who have been working to respond to this, feeling exasperated like they mm -hmm. couldn't do enough, um, feeling like their hands are tied, like she just so aptly put. What are some of the things that you're hearing from um, folks who are in this profession and are wanting some reprieve? What are, what are some of those things you're hearing? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, you know, a lot of what I hear from, from my comrades in medicine is that you know, they are, they are tired. Um, they're not tired of showing up and doing the work that they are committed to doing and taking care of people, but, you know, they are tired of seeing people of all ages, of all health statuses come into the hospital really, really sick and not some of them not leaving or some of them not leaving better than the way they came in, right? Coming, coming out with, with um, conditions that might, you know, set them up to really struggle for a large part of their life. I'm being gentle in how I approach it because I don't want to scare people more than we we are um, really conveying the importance of getting the vaccine. But, you know, some people are coming out with disabilities because they have really been hit hard by COVID and, and the devastation it causes. I'm also hearing from my colleagues in medicine that they are themselves dealing with anxiety, depression. They're showing up, they're vaccinated, they're doing everything they can to protect themselves. But the more people that are coming into the hospital without this being under control, they're at risk. They're not able to be, spend time with their families. Look, I'm a mother, I have a 16 month old. I'm lucky that in my line of work, I get to stay at home and do it. But my colleagues who cannot, what are they doing when they go home to see their children, right? They are essentially serving as a front line with what Dr. Contessa said, we don't have a cure for it. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of exhaustion. I'm hearing, you know, people struggling to maintain that hope because again, we're seeing the vaccine is here. We were hoping to see the numbers really increase in terms of, in terms of people committing to, to getting the vaccine and we're not seeing that. And so what does that mean for people who are on the front line? Here we go again, right? How many more cases can they take before they make decisions about where they practice, frankly? You know, and I, I, I wouldn't blame some of my colleagues if they found other areas to maybe engage in work because this is scary stuff. And we have a vaccine. We have something that can help people to keep them out of the hospital and, you know, keep them keep them home with their families. But yet people are still so hesitant. I know we talked about some things that people can do, but again, my colleagues are, are tired and they're looking for the community to do the right thing and support them so that they can also take care of people 
who are coming in for other reasons, right? People are still having heart attacks. People are still coming in with other conditions and our, our ICU beds need to be available for people dealing with those real issues as well. Thank you, Dr. Jess. Lisa and Elizabeth, a question for you is, um, Lisa, I know you went very, very early um, to get your vaccine, but did you have any trepidation um, that you had to work through um, when you were contemplating um, getting the vaccine? I will tell y'all my shame, my shameful story <laughs> um, after, but I want to hear from you all if you had any concerns or reservations at all and what you did to overcome them. You know, for me, I, I didn't because I think it's kind of like Dr. Contessa said, knowing that there's no cure, but a vaccine is at least the idea of you're actually putting a little COVID in your system, right? Like we're kind of building up this immune system. So maybe you're not, that's not right. She shook her head. No, I don't know. I feel like, is that wrong, Dr. Contessa? Let, let, let her chime in really quick. Cause this, okay. I'm glad that you said that cause it actually came up in the, in the comments as well. That is not right. But Dr. Contessa okay. is a medical professional. She will cl clarify and then we'll go yeah, right clarify. back into it. Right. Okay. Well, real quick, I'm going to actually answer a couple of the questions as well in the same way I'm answering this one. So the way the vaccine, so let's talk about first what the virus does. All the virus is, just like the vaccine, is information. The virus is information on how to continue to replicate itself. So what it does is it comes into your body with the goal of infecting as many cells as it can and replicating and replicating and replicating. Sometimes it's the respiratory tract, which is why you have runny nose, sore throat. Sometimes it's your actual your lungs, which is how you get pneumonia. But sometimes it's your GI tract, which is why you get diarrhea, you throw up. Sometimes, it, I mean, literally it can affect, and that's, sometimes it's your blood system, which is why you get blood clots, right? So going, talking about that, with the mRNA vaccines, the ones that we've been using, the Pfizer and Moderna, they literally just take the information. It literally is purely information that comes into your body about how the vac um, how the virus looks and the spike protein, information on the spike protein. So again, it's essentially like giving your body the play. So when it sees it, it can mount its defensive team up to attack it. But the problem is, if you don't have the vaccine, it's not about how strong you guys are. They're just standing there on the sidelines. They don't even know they're supposed to be in play. And that's what the vaccine does. It gives you, it tells you who the bad guys are and the good guys are so they can respond and then attack the bad guys. But the problem is by the time your natural immune system mounts a response, it's normally about two weeks. And we all know that some people don't live for two weeks with COVID. And by two weeks, it's taken over your whole entire body. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter how strong you are, it's not enough people on the team to attack, you know, to help fight the virus all over your body. Now we're talking about the treatments. So people talked about monoclonal antibodies, which that means is we give you a little bit of, for people who have recovered from the vaccine or, I mean, from the virus or even artificially, more defense, more antibodies, which is what your body normally makes. They use antibodies to fight infection. However, a lot of time, unfortunately, even when you get, say for instance, there are a million virus. We call it your viral load. There are a million viruses in your body that are attacking everything. We give you 300 monoclonal antibodies. How is that possibly going to overcome a million? And what we don't know is how fast that virus replicate in your body and how much of your body has already been attacked. And unfortunately, from person to person, that varies. We can never tell, which is why one young, healthy person can fight it and have no problem whatsoever. But for another person, their viral load is so high, it has already overwhelmed their immune system. And so that's why, and then going back to Rindesivir, what it does, again, it actually is a medicine, and these are both IV medications that you usually get either in the hospital or at a fusion center, and it's reserved for the very, very sick. Again, that medicine, it blocks it from going into cells. But if it's already a million cells that are taken over, then blocking 20 or 30 more cells, it's already too late. And so that's what we're saying. All these things that we're doing, we're chasing our tail. We're always trying to catch up to this virus, which job is only just to continue to replicate. And once it goes from one to two to four, to 16, and that's how it replicates. It doesn't go one, two, three, four. And that's why, again, just understanding the play, understanding how the game is played, that's what the vaccine does. And it gives your body 
when it's not in a fight, the chance to go ahead and mount the immune response in advance. So when it does, when one, one virus comes into your body, 50 of your team is going to come and attack it. They're going to they gonna jump it, you know, kind of using the old school playground term, right? But once the gang has already shown up, it's too late. You know, your one little, one or two little antibodies and the ones that we give you in the hospital is just not enough because they've already taken over your, your whole body. And that's kind of what we're trying to say. It's, it's just, we just don't have enough tools at this point and viruses, their whole job is to seek and destroy. And, and SARS-CoV-2 does it, does it really, really well. So at least I want to come back to you, but I have one follow-up for Dr. Contessa. Um, first, I hope you weren't jumping anybody on the playground. Um, but I do, <laughs> I do want to ask you about, <laughs> about, um, Johnson and Johnson, and you mentioned, um, in your remarks, uh, of, of course, Moderna and Pfizer, you didn't talk about Johnson and Johnson. And of course there are other countries that are getting AstraZeneca. Do you have a hierarchy of what you suggest people get? Is there any particular issue? I got some bias around Johnson and Johnson. I'll hold that. I don't know who sponsored this. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But I just I, I'm curious to know if you have any um, like a hierarchy of recommendations on the types of vaccination or which companies vaccination. And I would love to hear what Dr. Jessica thinks, but I would say this again, we talked about the side effects that we've we've seen um, be distributed um, be, occur in, in people who are being vaccinated and how it's really, again, seven per million. And they're talking overall, not just. Um, Pfizer and Moderna, which are the two mRNA vaccines, um, we're talking overall. Um, I say some protection is better than none. And when it comes to risk and benefit, especially if you're an older person or if you have any comorbidities, and when I'm saying comorbidities, I'm talking about including the one of the biggest risk factors for a severely poor outcome is obesity, is obesity. And so for people who who are, you know, otherwise healthy, but just, you know, overweight, any vaccine is better than none. And it it, it all depends because I know, for instance, um, I'm a veteran also. So when I go into the VA, sometimes they'll over, you know, when they're, they'll broadcast today, we have Moderna, today we have Pfizer. So it's kind of all about availability and location. And for those people who only going to do one shot, I mean, Johnson & Johnson is your best. If you know you're not going to come back for that follow-up shot, go with what you know you're going to, if you're going to complete it, complete it is better than just the one shot. So, but I love to hear what Dr. Jessica has to say about that. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm, I'm nodding because I'm like, whoa, we're on the same page because I, I would also encourage people, um, you know, my, my sort of expertise is around the mental health, but obviously as a medical doctor too, we, we talk about these things, but I would agree if you have access to any vaccine, it's going to be important to give it a try because what you might find is that you'll give yourself an out. Oh, I have to wait for this one. No, you know, if you have it available show up and get it. And I, I prob we probably will see conversations continue around, you know, people are talking about boosters and that can be where you sort of get in the weeds, but you can always talk to your, your, your doctor personally about what makes sense for you. But I'm, I'm glad I'm on the same page with you, Dr. Contessa. So I want to come back to Lisa, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it, this was so good because in our humanity, there are things that we kind of naturally fear are things that we've been taught about vaccines that we kind of just Carrie, Lisa, we're not medical doctors. We just listen. We read the paper and stuff. So, Lisa, I want to hear from you again about <laughs> if you had any trepidation, because there are some folks in the comments right now who still have some concerns, right? And of yeah. course, they have folks at home who are concerned too. So, Lisa, and then I'll come to you, Elizabeth, and we'll open. Okay, with and, and I think you're right. It's like part of it was the Holy Spirit for me. It was like the fact that I got the opportunity at the way that I got it. I knew that it was the right way to go. So that's my real answer. That's my honest answer. Because the way that it came about for us to get them that early was just only God. The second thing was that um, I just felt like you had to have the vaccine. I mean, obviously it was deadly and we had already seen the numbers were astronomical. So clearly no single body was able to really beat it. So you know that you need help. And I felt like the vaccine was a good choice. Again, I got it. My husband didn't. He went through all that he did. I think my biggest uh, concern is that my daughter, who's 14, I had her vaccinated. And then as we learn more, that part for me is a little concerning just because you're hoping that it doesn't have long term effects on children, you know, in ways of as we see. And again, news, there's so much information out there. And for as much good, positive information, there's also a lot of things that are negative that try to keep us from 
moving in that direction, like uh, dealing with fertility and will that affect these young people having these shots and things like that. But again, I, I move in prayer and I just felt like it was the right thing to do. My husband ended up after recovering and waiting 30 days, I believe it was 30 days or 60 days, I forget, don't quote me, but he was able to get his shots. Um, my son is only 11, so he's the only one who's not vaccinated. And you know, I'm hoping that when he gets to a certain age that he can be vaccinated. So um, it, it's just part of it is stepping out on faith. Part of it is just recognizing and doing the numbers and just, like you said, research and education and just trying to figure out what's best for our family. And then fellowshipping and sharing this information and just feeling like we survived something that could have hit my whole family in a way that we didn't make it. So I, I don't think anybody has like all the answers, but we have to all try to figure out like, listen, this particular time, when I look at people, the people that I surround myself with, and when I'm out in the world looking, people do so many things that are not good for themselves. Between food choices, between what they're smoking, between what they're drinking. When I look and I smell and I see all the vices that our people have, I'm just trying to keep it real because this is just from my heart what I see. I see our people have so many vices and you want to tell me you don't want to get your vaccine like that's something that's going to hurt you. Trust me, the decisions that we're making every day from food, smoking and drinking is has I just feel like that's a much worse decision and choices that we make every day as opposed to getting that vaccine. That's that's my real answer and what I felt like in my spirit that I that was what was best for my family. And I try to share that with our people. Like I, I put it on my Instagram and I showed that I got my shot and hoping to inspire other people. And I really had to wait for my husband to recover to really even tell his story because I wasn't really sure how that was going to end because we were really at a touch and go place. Um, but, you know, again, it's a testimony. And like my husband said, you know, it's a, it, we have to share that story because there's a lot of black men out there that don't trust, uh, a lot of women who don't trust, you know. And I think that for us as black women, we have to continue to spread the word and even pull these brothers along because that's a part of our community and we can't have them dropping in numbers because that's, you know, <laughs> that's an effect on us as a people. So the information is so important. And I thank you, Dr. Contessa and Dr. Jessica, just for being able to articulate it and, and being educated in this space that most of us are not. And we're just kind of going from what we know what grandma said and from, you know, family communities and, and not having that trust to really trying to have these type of platforms to say, hey, we got to do this different. This would not have been rolled out to the world if they were just trying to take out our, our, our people. You know what I mean? So it doesn't make sense to think those old school ways that this is something that's going to help us survive and move forward. And, and God forbid, you know, we come look back 20 years and we go, oh, the effects of what that, you know, that vaccine did was X, Y, and Z. But some people would not even here to be able to have that story. So yeah, that that's my... I love it. <laughs> Lisa said, the doors of the church are now open, Elizabeth, for you to have before. <laughs> and if you came uh, through any trepidation, any anxiety yourself when you were considering um, getting the vaccine, or were you always like, shoot me up? No, I mean, I wasn't necessarily like, shoot me up. Um, I think my visit, biggest hesitation initially was just like, I didn't know a lot about the vaccine, so I, I felt like it was rushed. And then it wasn't until we started having these conversations uh, through the players union with like literal epidemiologists that talk about how we've been studying mRNA technology for decades and, um, you know, talking to uh, public health experts that study this data for years and years and talk about how these types of viruses affect us. I think it was after that that I was like, okay, like now I understand, like, of course I want to get the vaccine. I don't, and I also, um, we've touched on this a little bit, but we don't know how the virus will affect us individually. Like it's, it, there are people, it's affected young athletes in a way that we wouldn't expect, right? And they've like dealt with long COVID and you look at them and you're like, wow, like they're healthy, they don't drink, they don't do anything. But again, we don't know how that can affect us. And so for me, and for the majority of our league, we said, I don't want to take that risk. I would rather look at this data, look at the science behind vaccines and and the research that's been done for so long and seeing that these were probably the most diverse clinical trials that we've seen in a long time as well. And so like putting all of that together, 
I think is what allowed me to feel really comfortable in getting the vaccine. You know, the, um, the other thing that's present for me, and I know um, has come up in earlier questions, um, and I, um, Denise, I see your question about the T-cells and antibodies, but first I want to come to the doctors on um, children. Lisa talked about getting her daughter vaccinated. Her son is too young. My godson is a year too young. Um, there's some real concerns about vaccines, period, not just COVID vaccines, but vaccines, period, with children and the effects they have on them. What do you tell mothers um, who may be concerned, godmothers, who may be concerned about the impact on children um, long term? I'll start with you, Dr. Jess. Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, I, I was actually um, just going to, you know, I, I think part of what I, I try to do is is really direct them to resources that are, are trusted, um, you know, directing them to the American Pediatric Association to look at their recommendations, to hear what those doctors are saying about um, the effects of, of the COVID vaccine, but then also on getting COVID, you know, with the Delta variant, we're seeing more children are being affected with that. So again, this is another reason why getting the vaccine is gonna not only protect you, but your children. Um, and then, you know, when it's time for them, you know, I kind of remind people that I'm, I'm in this position myself, you know, we take my child to, um, you know, his pediatric visits, he's lined up with getting, you know, vaccines every visit we go, but we do it because we know that the reason he is protected and the reason I've been protected and, you know, generations who have been able to get these vaccines, it's because the vaccines work, right? We're not seeing polio. We're not seeing these conditions that were plaguing, you know, uh, you know, communities um, long before. So a lot of what I try to do is direct people to the right place. I tell them it's, it's you know, the best that we have and we have to do our, our work to, to make sure that communities are, are taken care of. But Dr. Contessa, I know this is like more of your um, expertise for sure. Okay, well, I do have to go back to someone. At, so it kind of goes into the whole vaccine and the T cells and B cells. Again, you have to liken this to the T cells and B cells are your defense, but they're on the sideline, right? They're just waiting to be activated. They don't know when the game has started. And unfortunately, with any virus, especially a new one like SARS-CoV-2, it's a new virus. So you're, it easily infects you. The Delta virus is the Delta variant of um, SARS-CoV-2 is double, is more, is more infectious than the initial one that started in um, 2019. And so what we have learned is that your T cells and B cells respond to late. It takes a long time for your immune, spon um, immune system, which you have the natural things, the T cells, your B cells, antibodies. Those are in your body, but if they don't know when to get to work, then they're just standing around letting everything just tear up your body. And that's what happens with COVID. Um, and when you think about the vaccine, what the vaccine does is it kind of, again, gives you a little bit of memory. So um, how long that lasts, because people are asking about the booster shot, we unfortunately just don't know. The first person got vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine in March of 2020. March of 2020. It was a volunteer. I think it was March. Yeah, March 2020. And it was a volunteer in Seattle, Washington, who was the very first one. So now we're at August of 2021. So we do have a lot more information than we had last year. And I know a lot of people are like, it's so new. Well, as Elizabeth said before, it's actually not new. SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to SARS and MERS. And so they were already working on vaccines for SARS and MERS. All those people who are working in these labs, not just in America, but all over the world, just use the same kind of technology that they have been working on for SARS and MERS and just converted it to SARS-CoV-2. So that's how that happened. That's how, and it's been over a decade since they've created this you know, technology to use it. But there was zero interest because there was no SARS-CoV-2. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that helps. So there are a number of questions um, in the chat around children going back to school. So for the kids who are not eligible for the vaccine, yeah, that would be everybody under 12. Um, what are some of the, um, some of the measures that can be taken to help keep children safe when folks are like, I'm not gonna be able to keep them at home, maybe for my own sanity, Dr. Jess, or because it's time for them to go back to school from a legal standpoint, that's what the law is saying. What do we do to keep the kids safe? Best practices, what do y'all have? 
Yeah, I think it comes back to what we've been using, you know, all this time prior to the vaccine, right? Social distancing, wearing the mask, frequent hand washing, you know, encouraging this behavior because obviously the students are mixing, right? You know, if you're 11 and you're on the cusp, you might be in the in the same room as 12 year olds and the 12 year olds may get to, you know, not wear masks. So what I hope that we see is that there is more of a sort of national and at least local level push to really make sure that these kids are safe because we still have a large part of our population children who don't have access to the vaccine. But we know those measures have worked, but we also know that now that the vaccine is here, this is gonna help to move us out of this pandemic. But until these children can get vaccinated, we have to make sure that we're still engaging in those practices. The World Health Organization even encourages us all to still wear masks, even if we're vaccinated, because globally, you know, people are still being affected really, really hard with this. So I would say continue those measures. And, you know, then you really, from like a mental health standpoint, you know, you do have to make those decisions within your family around where children might go to school. And I know that's a separate conversation, Angela, but, you know, as a parent, this is what I'm thinking about. I'm like, thank goodness. You know, my 16 month old is not in a place where we have to put him in school. But if this was something we had to explore, I'd really be looking for those schools that are really encouraging, you know, mask mandates, making sure that all children are safe and they're not just kind of poo pooing over those who can't get the vaccine because we know children are being affected from the Delta variant as well. I love that you um, talked about the World Health Organization because there was a question in the chat and I know we have to run, but there was a question in the chat about whether we should listen to the World Health Organization or the CDC. A lot of folks know that the CDC just a couple months ago was like, okay, if you're outside, it's cool. Don't wear a mask. And I was like, the devil is a lie. I'm going to have this mask on. <laughs> I'm not fooling with y'all. Like, I don't know what y'all got going on. So again, it's one of those moments where they're the professionals, but they haven't been guiding us down the right path so much. And in some instances, not all around. What do you guys do, Dr. Contest? I see you like, I don't know if that's a grimace or a grin. So I want to come here to hear what you what you think about that. And we'll we'll part um here because I know we're over time by one minute already. Sure. Well, well, number one, two, and three cause of death for until vaccines were created was infection. Still all around the world in places where people can't get vaccinated, it's still infection kills everybody. And so now in our developed country, the thing that kills us is our lifestyle, right? Things, you know, obesity related illness. However, infection is not really a big deal because we are easily, we have easy access to vaccination. So that puts that question to me to the side. Um, and then going to whether or not, you know, the issue with school, well, 50%, um, what they say, 50% of kids lost um, their math and science skills for in the last year. And so there's kind of this issue with, okay, we are exposing our kids, but then also they're not being educated at home. So we've learned that schools really do have some validity when it comes to education, because that's really what they're for. That's what they're about. And I'm a doctor, but I don't do education with my kids very well. I'm just terrible at it. I can just tell you right now. I'm like, I'm working with a patient. I need you to go over there and do whatever it is you're doing. And hopefully it's cool. But if it's not, we'll get to that in the next couple of years. <laughs> so that's kind of what it's just true. They're better at school. They do a better job. Um, but what also needs to happen is vaccination, because what we do is create a cocoon of protection around those who can't be vaccinated. And that's true with everybody. In order for us to reach what's called herd immunity, 60% of the world population of the 8 billion people in the world, not just America, have to be infected, like it has to have some immunity. And that means either natural infection or vaccination. And so for the people who want to debate the vaccination, well, the other alternative, alternative is just for the infection to go through the world and wipe out as many people as it possibly can. Those who survive are the ones who are left protected. Those who don't, sorry. And the vac vaccinated ones also provide some protection. And what happened a couple of months ago when they start telling people to take their mask off is we actually hit a plateau. The Delta and Lambda variant were not present. And so now, since they've continued to spread around the world, because again, we, when Delta came about, we first land, we heard about it. We were like, man, this is new variant that's actually really infecting people really easily. And that's what happened. And so now we've gone. And then what also happened was between June and August, if you look at the vaccination chart, we were at like 45% and it stayed. It's not even 50% yet, right? It's, it, we, very few people, once we kind of like took the mask off and felt like we were going in the right direction, people stopped getting vaccinated. And so that's kind of this, res, you know, this whole recipe for worldwide destruction. And so either, unfortunately, we're gonna all get vaccinated or the infection is going to run ramshot 
on the world population and we're going to be taken out. And that is just a she, I, tell me, Dr. Jessica, if I'm I'm not trying to be extreme, but that is why I think that's what health professionals are trying to say that there is that's the only way immunity happens. It either happens from natural infection and you're getting some immunity from your T cells and B cells because you've seen it before. Not it doesn't you don't get immune from not seeing something before. So you either get infection and then you have immunity after the infection or you get vaccinated. But those who don't have either one of those things, they are playing with fire. I know that we have to wrap. Um, I know um, Puff put, had a campaign in 2004. The election, the, the election campaign was vote or die. We are not encouraging death today. We are saying get vaxxed, don't lie. How about that for a Jesse Jacksonism tonight? And I think um, the other thing that's really important for us to remember is wash your doggone hands. There are people out here in these streets who are talking about not even washing their bodies. You know, we're not going to do that. That is not for the culture. And I will not digress too far on that. And I think most importantly, continue to encourage people in your family, your community, um, and even folks you don't like to get vaccinated um, because we don't want this um, pandemic to run roughshod through our country, through our communities and all over the world, as Dr. Contessa said. Elizabeth, Lisa, Dr. Contessa, and Dr. Jess, I thank you so much for spending your time with Black Women's Health Imperative this evening. Folks, thank you so much for your questions. I'm going to suggest Black Women's Health Imperative have one just about the kids because there are tons of questions um, about children in here and they're valid. Folks want to know, should they be sending their kids to school? What's going on with the mask situation? All of it. Please wear your mask and don't listen to these people because they don't know. There have been folks who've been wearing masks a long time on the plane just to prevent getting colds and that works. So why not? Right. Um, I'm coming from you as a coming to you as a germaphobe. It has been so amazing to be with you all this evening. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I am going to turn it back over to am I turning it over to anyone? Apparently not. In case somebody wants to come up, you are welcome to come up. Otherwise, thank you all for sharing time with us this evening. Y'all were amazing. Thank you.